Around 60 AD, the Roman Empire had successfully taken control of most parts of Europe, but Britannia remained defiant. On the island of Mona, the Roman army arrived with the intention of wiping out 300 Druids, executing them without mercy. Despite the imminent threat of death, the Druids maintained their faith in a legend about a warrior goddess who would eventually free them from Roman oppression, offering fervent prayers in their final moments. Commander Paulinus, back in Rome, communicated the details of this brutal event to King Nero, discussing the Druids' belief in a warrior goddess. Worried about the potential emergence of a Druidic savior, Nero issued a decree that prohibited women from holding positions of authority. Meanwhile, in Britannia, the Iceni tribe led a peaceful life under the rule of King Prasitagus and his queen, proud parents of two daughters. One day, the warrior Chiron informed Prasitagus about Rome's new procurator, Catus, who didn't have favorable feelings toward Britannia. While the men discussed this matter, the queen took her daughters to language lessons and a beauty session, followed by a visit to the market. There, the girls were surprised to witness men being crucified, initially believed by the queen to be criminals, but her maid clarified that they were Christians executed for their faith. Undeterred, the queen continued her visit to the market with her daughters. During their time there, they came across Trinovant warriors drinking. Upon spotting the queen, Cardamonda knelt and addressed her as Boudica. This act caused the other warriors to bow, but a stall owner, who overheard the maid explaining the legend to the girls, objected in the name of Rome and tried to seize the queen. Cardamonda quickly stepped in, injuring the man and then beheading him, prompting everyone to scatter before Roman guards arrived. After some time, Prasitagus reveals that he had to negotiate with the centurions to clear his wife's name. For approximately a year, the queen is forbidden from going to the market and has to send servants for her needs. Inquisitive, the queen questions why the Trinovant warriors considered her a goddess, and Prasitagus suggests it might be because of her ancestral heritage. Later in the day, the queen and her daughters engage in play with training swords, although it's evident they lack proper training. Prasitagus joins the activity, and they spot Kieran, who has been somber since losing his family in the war. While the queen playfully engages in swordplay with her husband, Prasitagus reflects that her ancestral characteristics are more evident than he previously thought. Recognizing her heritage, Prasitagus decides to present her with a treasured gift, the Boudicca sword, an ancient weapon crafted with lost magic and safeguarded by the Druids for generations, its color shifting in the light of the fire. The next day, the Roman procurator Catus pays a visit to the Iceni, compelling Prasitagus to display submission. During a dinner gathering, the locals pretend to honor Catus' visit, despite feeling uneasy about his condescending remarks and his interest in their fort, hinting at his desire to claim it. Prasitagus then instructs his men to behave flawlessly, as Catus could use any minor mistake as a pretext to destroy their village. He requests Kieran to assemble a group of outlaws and troublemakers to showcase to Catus, aiming to highlight the dangers of the land and discourage him from settling there. Although Kieran complies, he is not fond of the plan. Later, Prasitagus and his men set out to capture the bandits for Catus. Upon their return after several days, Kieran delivers devastating news to the queen. Prasitagus has been defeated in a surprise attack during the skirmish. Heartbroken, the queen collapses, angrily rebuking the men for failing to protect their king. The next day, with no male heirs, the Iceni tribe declares her their new queen leader and presents her with the royal torque, symbolizing her status. Kieran appears displeased with this turn of events. However, the ceremony is abruptly interrupted by Catus and his soldiers. Catus asserts that the Roman Empire doesn't acknowledge female leaders and sees the tribute they sent as a bribe. As a consequence, he declares the confiscation of her lands and severe repercussions for her and her daughters. He also reveals that Kieran disclosed Prasitagus' location, leading to his ambush. The soldiers forcefully separate the queen from her daughters, discard her torque, and strip her before tying her to a tree, where she endures a brutal whipping. The tribe is compelled to watch helplessly, with any dissenters restrained by the soldiers. Following the beating, they mark her face with Nero's initials, a practice usually reserved for slaves. That night, Cardamonda and the Trinovant warriors sneak into the Roman camp, discreetly eliminating several guards. They find and rescue the queen, avoiding detection by crossing a river and reaching the Trinovant tribe, where they attend to her injuries. While recovering in a state of feverish delirium and fixating on her daughters, Cardamonda informs her that she must now regard the Trinovant tribe as her family. To her relief, her daughters soon enter the tent, reuniting with her. Cardamonda also provides her with a set of teeth taken from a centurion, stressing the importance of a warrior's bite. In the following days, as her health gets better, the queen steps outside to find her daughters being trained in combat by the warriors. She requests a break to spend time together, discovering that Cardamonda, too, 
had suffered the loss of children due to Roman brutality. The girls disclose that the Trinovant tribe views the mark from Catus as a symbol of her leadership, encouraging her to unite the tribes against Rome. They emphasize that she must accept this fate. Afterward, the queen tries to practice with a training dummy, but her techniques are unpolished. Fortunately, one of the warriors helps her, instructing her on the proper way to strike. Their training is disrupted when Cartamanda shows up with the Boudicca sword, having retrieved it by killing a soldier to whom Catus had given it. The queen is profoundly touched by this gesture, but her instructor notes that bronze is not an ideal material for a sword. This moment is followed by the arrival of Wolfger and his tribe, who come to meet the queen. Wolfger, unimpressed by her lack of experience and proper armor, suggests he should take the lead. He ridicules her sword and snaps it in half, tossing it into the river. The queen plunges into the water to retrieve it, causing concern among the warriors due to the river's hazardous currents. Surprisingly, she emerges with the sword, now mysteriously repaired, earning the admiration of everyone. Following this, Wolfger declares his and his men's backing for her. Later in the evening, the warriors return the royal torque to the queen and conduct a ceremony, formally acknowledging Boudicca as the leader of the United Tribes. In her heartfelt speech, she talks about reclaiming their freedom and suggests ambushing Cata's convoy in two days. Wolfger expresses skepticism, pointing out the strength of Cata's army and the risk of defeat. However, Boudicca's demonstration of making her sword levitate and return to her hand is viewed as a powerful omen. When Boudicca gets ready to face the enemy alone in the forest, Wolfger and his warriors join her, deciding to support her cause. They gather behind her, chanting her name, prepared to stand by her side in battle. After two days, Kieran, now part of the Roman army, leads a convoy through the forest. They come across Boudicca standing alone on the road. She asks for a meeting with Cartus. Initially ignoring her, Kieran changes his stance when she insists, threatening violence and prompting him to fetch his commander. Upon Cartus's arrival, he fails to recognize Boudicca. Seizing the opportunity, she asserts her queen status, summons her sword, and swiftly kills Cartus. This action triggers an ambush by the tribe's warriors, who quickly surround the Romans. A fierce battle erupts, with the Romans trying to defend themselves or escape. However, Boudicca's forces are relentless, eliminating every Roman they encounter. Boudicca herself, despite occasional missteps or losing her weapon, continues to fight fiercely until there are no more Romans, and their heads are displayed on spikes. After the battle, the tribe searches the bodies, gathering gold and valuables. Kieran is captured while trying to escape and brought before Boudicca. Enraged by his betrayal, she repeatedly stabs him. Wolfger steps in, calming her down, and she decides they should head for Camulos. Wolfger agrees but suggests they seek the Druid Council's blessing first. That night, the Druids give their blessing, symbolized by Boudicca and Wolfger drinking from Carta's skull, following tradition. Later, Wolfger tries to court Boudicca, even though he already has two wives, but she rejects him, remaining loyal to her late husband, King Prasitagus. Left alone, Boudicca is approached by another druid who discusses the meaning of life with her. The druid discloses that her daughters have passed away, a harsh reality that Boudicca finds hard to accept. Reflecting on her family's history, Boudicca hears from the druid that her daughter's spirits will always be with her. The druid also reveals that Boudicca's own life will come to an end soon, but not before she leads her army once more. Disturbed by these revelations, Boudicca leaves the shack to check with Wolfger if he can see her daughters. He acknowledges that they are products of her imagination, causing Boudicca to collapse from emotional strain. Upon regaining consciousness in a bed, Boudicca is accompanied by the apparitions of her daughters. Realizing they are not real, she still treasures their presence and vows that they will be together again soon. A few days later, Boudicca and her troops arrive at Camulos, a town transformed into a retirement community for elderly Roman soldiers after the locals were massacred. The town easily succumbs to Boudicca's army, leading to a brutal slaughter of the aged Romans, with heads gruesomely severed. The conquest happens swiftly, and after plundering, they set the settlement on fire, with Boudicca declaring that this is only the beginning. Back at their camp, Boudicca observes the warriors celebrating in a peculiar manner. Wolfger explains that they are marking their faces like hers as a tribute. Initially upset, associating the mark with enslavement, Boudicca is reassured by Wolfger that they are redefining its meaning, given their illiteracy. In Cambridge Forest, they ambush another Roman convoy, mercilessly killing many soldiers. Boudicca's forces become more skilled and ruthless with each battle, decapitating enemies without hesitation. Later in London, they initiate a nighttime assault on the harbor, igniting Roman ships. Despite the Romans' attempts to defend, they are overcome by the fierce tribesmen. Boudicca takes particular delight in decapitating the Roman captain, reveling in the triumph. 
In Rome, chaos erupts as riots engulf the city, and buildings are set ablaze. The populace, frustrated by the costly war, demands victory. Paulinus tries to save Emperor Nero, but Nero, feeling abandoned by Rome and identifying himself more as a musician than a warrior, chooses to end his own life. Deeply affected by Nero's death, Paulinus pledges to achieve the victory Rome demands, informing his troops of their imminent departure. News of Nero's death and Paulinus' journey soon reaches Britannia, causing concern among the tribes. Wolfger and Boudicca discuss the king's army's formidable nature, and Wolfger suggests a strategic retreat to regroup with additional forces from the north in the spring. Despite Wolfger's counsel, Boudicca insists on pressing forward, driven by the spirits of her daughters and her refusal to form a political alliance with Wolfger. Unable to find common ground in their strategies, Wolfger departs with his men, leaving Boudicca with only the Trinovant tribe. The next day, as they get ready for battle, they get word that Paulinus is heading to Watling Street. Excited for a confrontation, Boudicca inspires her tribe with a passionate speech and a symbolic gesture to the land, pledging to reclaim their freedom. However, as they hurry towards the road, the Roman soldiers surprisingly let them pass, revealing Paulinus' strategic setup for an ambush. The Romans, armed with archers, launch a devastating attack. In a desperate attempt, Boudicca tries to use her carriage for cover, but it proves ineffective as her warriors swiftly fall. Faced with the harsh reality, her daughters inform her that her time has arrived. Rejecting surrender, Boudicca readies herself for a valiant fight. Out of the blue, screams from the forest signal Wolfger's return with reinforcements, catching the Romans off guard. Despite their unexpected attack and turning the Romans' crossbows against them, the Romans' superior numbers eventually overpower them, resulting in the demise of Wolfger and Cardamanda in the battle. Witnessing these losses, Boudicca is overtaken by rage and proceeds to eliminate as many Romans as possible. However, her daughter's spirits intervene, reminding her that the time has come to join her family in the afterlife. In the middle of this intense moment, Boudicca is hit by an arrow. Seeing this chance, the Romans surround her and inflict fatal wounds with multiple stabs. As Boudicca gives in to her injuries, her thoughts dwell on her family. In her last moments, she imagines her spirit joining her loved ones in the afterlife. Jumping ahead to contemporary times, there's a statue in London commemorating Boudicca and her daughters, acting as a lasting tribute to their legacy. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on the notification bell if you want to watch more videos like this. Thank you for watching and see you again soon. Take care.